I think that superstition was the greatest protector of archaeological monuments that Ireland ever had. Absolutely. And it's an awful pity that people are not uh, superstitious nowadays. Yeah. You pick your best tours for the outside, in other words. There you are, right there. So there were no left handed sacrifices this way. Unless they taught themselves to be right handed. Correct. Yeah, so right. No, I'm right handed. That could have been a sadder. If you do that, it rocks back and it'll keep rocking now for a, for a good while. For a good while yeah. Even this one with the flat iron. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get the ball going. Get the ball going. <laughs> yeah, that's the story. The original name was the pole. The pole? Whatever it meant, I don't know. No. I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, you can't see the wood for the trees. Now, I've always taken that to mean that you're standing too close to see clearly. You're so taken up with the detail that you fail to see the bigger, possibly more beautiful picture before your eyes. I think that saying used to apply to this place because it's only in recent times that we've been afforded the kind of perspective that a little distance provides. It's not that the place has suddenly become beautiful. It was always thus, as the natives will tell you. It's just that the rest of us are beginning to see the wood and the river and the mountains and the town in their midst. Welcome to Newton Stewart in the county of Tyrone. It's really only since the arrival of that modern phenomenon known as the Bypass in 2002 that we can see Newton Stewart as it must have appeared to a traveller on horseback a few centuries ago. If that traveller had been passing after 1727, his eye would certainly have been caught by the six arches of the stone bridge that straddle the river Strill, although depending on which local he asked, he may well have been told it was the River Mourne. There would have been no dispute as to the rather charming names of the two mountains that overlooked the town. Mary Grey and Bessie Bell conjured up between them a poignant tale from Scotland that takes us back to the early 1600s, when this O'Neill stronghold became the new town of Sir William Stuart. Newton Stuart had the ill luck of being strategically important throughout the warring centuries, and the result is a legacy of proud and roofless ruins, stony reminders of the days when architects and engineers must have wondered why they bothered. This is Newton Stewart Castle, built by Sir William Stewart in the early 1600s. And as you can see, it was built to last, but it had the misfortune to attract the wrong sort of guest. King James II lodged here with some of his soldiers en route to begin the Siege of Derry in 1689. And so impressed were they with the castle's hospitality, its defences and its strategic location that, upon his return from his failed mission in Derry, he burnt it down. So much for royal patronage. He did that, of course, so that the Williamite forces couldn't avail themselves of the castle's comforts as he had done. It wasn't much fun trying to run a decent castle back in those days, especially if there was a king in the area looking to be put up for the night. If you refused to let him in and give him the best room in the house, he was liable to burn you down. On the other hand, if he did let him in and give him the run of the house, he was liable to burn you down. I wonder, did he even have the decency to say, look, sorry about this, I really enjoyed my stay here, but you know how it is, there's this other king in the area, and he's even worse than me, and I know he would just love it here. And by the way, have you a light on you? This elegant landmark left by Stuart's castle is a relatively recent structure compared to the much more subtle evidence of human habitation in the Newton Stuart area going back several thousand years. John Bradley is a native of Gallum, a bit to the north of the town, and his childhood was spent playing in and around rafts and Neolithic relics like this portal tomb which most definitely predates the pyramids. A, a good bit of that's missing, John, by the looks of things. I mean, if, if you had another one of a huge big slab of stone on this side, where mm -hmm. is it gone, in other words? Well, this is a problem, Joe. Uh, there has been a temptation in years gone by to get rid of stones. Yeah. Uh, or use them. Or use them for yeah. something else. Mm. Indeed, there is another portal tomb in the next town land over there. And in the 1930s, it was struck by lightning. Yeah, yeah. It had been quite uh, good and quite impressive, apparently. I wasn't around then. Yes, yes. Uh, but it was <coughs> struck by lightning, and now it's simply a lump of, of, uh, of stones. Rubble, really? Rubble. Not stage. much more than rubble. Yeah, yeah. 
No, this isn't the rubble in question. These stones are found in the Celtic Age Rath or Ringfort across the Bray from the tomb. To John and his childhood friends, this was, of course, a fairy fort, easily protected by the hazel trees that grew out of the ramparts and by the burn which tumbled like a mobile moat around the base of the mound. Here were nuts, fish, and what in those innocent bygone days passed for adventure. I suppose we were relatively isolated. I mean, when I was a child, I only went to the town once a year on St. Patrick's Day. The town being Newton Stewart? The town being Newton Stewart, Are you yes. serious? It's only, was... it's, only, it's only a stone's throw away. That's right. Well, uh, we that was a big treat. On St. Patrick's Day, we would go to the town and uh, we'd gorge ourselves with ice cream. Get away with that. And, uh, yeah. and you didn't you didn't go in like every Saturday to do the shopping and nothing like that at all? Well, I think we have to remember that we had to work. Uh, farmers' sons were expected to be working on the farm almost all the time. Yeah. Indeed, there were certain jobs that were deliberately kept to Saturdays when, when the boys would be home. Yes. Uh, like, like putting in the potatoes and, and then gathering the potatoes later on. Good. But uh, we had our own shop. We, we, uh, my father had a shop, you see. Up here? Up here in that, in that house that you saw. Yeah, yeah. And um, we killed our own pigs and uh, we produced our own eggs and uh, the, the old hens, when they stopped laying, we, we would uh, kill them and eat them for the Sunday dinner. We were self-sufficient in a big way. Mm. Mind you, the, the farmers would go to the creamery uh, before Nestle's uh, started taking the milk, the, the farmers would go to the creamery maybe once a week. Yes. And uh, then on a Thursday, the local bread man uh, would deliver the two papers, the Ulster Herald and the Constitution. Right. And uh, I got that job of delivering the Ulster Herald to the Catholic houses and the Constitution to the Protestant houses. Right. So you had, but, you, had a, you, you, you knew all your neighbours, obviously, by that stage, uh, anyway. But some of us took both papers. Yes, yes. And I can remember Mrs. Graham. Uh, she was a very lovely lady. And uh, she, on a Thursday, would give me a special treat. Uh, do you want a treat today, John? Yes, please, Mrs. Graham. And uh, she would go into the house and she'd come out with a bit of bread and butter and sometimes it would be a special treat because it would be bread and butter and jam, and jam as well. As well. You, so, were e you were kind of easily pleased in those days, <laughs> weren't you? Yeah, yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah, yeah. That's true now. Yeah. So self-sufficiency also depended on a good deal of cooperation, in other words. Very much so, yes. The, neighbors, right? so. the farmers would help each other out. Of course. Uh, yeah. Andy John Graham and my father and I used to help each other out a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you see, most farmers would have only had one horse so in order to plough, you'd have needed two horses. So um, you would loan your horse to Andy John for uh, one week, and yeah. then Andy John would loan his, his horse, horse to us for the next week, and right, so on. Right, right. So self-sufficiency also depended on a good deal of cooperation, in other words. Very much so, Between yes. The neighbors, right, oh, right. yes. So you obviously have fond memories, John, of, of growing up here. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, that, that, we're talking about the last century now, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm for, afraid for so, yes. Ones, you know? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there a wee smile plays on your face when you recall all of these kinds of things. Very much so. It must have been a happy, happy enough place. It to was be, happy, it? Joe, but uh, I think the loveliest time of year was the harvest time when we'd be cutting the corn and sticking it and then uh, putting it in the stacks mm. and then uh, threshing later on when uh, the thresher would come and the noise of the thresher. Mm. You could hear it for miles away and the excitement of watching the rats <laughs> running out of the stacks and trying to kill them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. what uh, farmer had got a good uh, dog, a good ratting dog, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then after that, and this is a rather sad thing too, at twilight, I can remember seeing the poorer families coming to the threshing site uh, with their bags, and they would fill these up with chaff. Mm. They'd fill up their bags with chaff. Now they would use this for their mattress See. They'd fill their mattresses in yeah. with this chaff, yeah. you see, and that would keep them going for another year. Mm. So they were uh, kind of leftovers, in other words, you know, they were mm -hmm. yeah, picking those up. That's you know. right. Yeah. Uh, the chaff, now that's the, the sort of, <coughs> you know, the, the, it's soft yes. and, and soft yes. and downy, yes. really. But uh, it was sad. Those people wouldn't have come in the daytime because they, they would be, I suppose, embarrassed about, uh, about uh, having to take it. Sure. But then again, mm. of course, you'd set fire to the chaff uh, after a day or two, mm. and uh, the lovely smell of the chaff burning. 
but uh, mm. you can still, last, you can still, can still smell, smell it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yes. Sure, yeah. It's wonderful. The smell of burning chaff is such a powerfully evocative memory for John that I can almost imagine it myself. Around Barney McCoggan's house in Upper Gallon, no imagination is required to savour the sweet scent of turf burning, and that provides quite a seamless connection to a past that is much, much older than Barney's 80-odd years. It was while Barney and his wife Mary were instructing me on the engineering of the Taj Mahal of turf stacks, a considerable hazard to themselves, that the story emerged of how Barney's father unearthed the Stone Age with a turf spade. We were digging up posts underneath 12 foot above, you see yes. the last turf. We were 12 foot down and all 12 words. foot down, good right. enough. Right. And the top of them had been decayed. And my father and my two brothers had been lifting them, you know, yeah. cutting them. And the, my father would have pulled it up, you know. This end was sticking into the clay. Yeah. And he would have done this with his hands, boys, boys. That could be thousand years. But before my father got through in a thousand years, me and my brother Jared would have said it could be twenty years. I don't know what you're chatting about. Yeah. Says that them was pointed by uh, flint. And right now he did come on flint. And we got them two bits of flint in the bottom. Right. A lot of hazel nuts. And we used to scrape them along the ground in the afternoon and it gave a great light. The actual know, flint were still down underneath. Uh, flint. Where the stakes oh, big, were. big lumps. No, just the flint and the, the flints. And the pose. Yes. A bit every bit. A bit there for that apart, look. So what you were uncovering was an old field system underneath. Underneath and a wall. So you're talking not even a thousand years, it could be a couple of thousand, uh, several thousand 3, years. Three thousand nine hundred and fifty years. Three thousand nine hundred and fifty yes, years. Fine out. Be with two universities. And there was a farm there, I know yes. was about that all those years. That's holy girl. Well then uh, ministry man then. Well cutting away at that time and the ministry man happened for then. And they says to me, I'm wanting to remap ground that you've broken in. And he says then, why didn't you break that? I know where they are. Well, yeah. that old gorse grown on. Yeah, yeah. And I says, that was, uh, that's too wet. Mm. It's all bog. And I started to tell him, he says, you know, Bernard, he says, you should have reported that. Yeah. Oh, we didn't pay that, didn't we? We didn't that's pay that. That's 14 aid. years ago. The next years. morning, we're going to see somebody in the hospital, home. Early in the morning, these two girls landed the door to the girl in the name of Foley from Belfast. And yes. Another yeah. one. We were around several days. And they said that what we called an old ditch underneath it. They called it a wall. A wall. So did they yeah. ask you that to cut any more turf out of that? Is that the... Yeah. That yeah. It didn't really say it. They would prefer if you didn't uh, cut any more turf. Uh, it was a polite way of yes. saying, uh, please yes. don't cut any more yes. turf. No, well, well, money, you already uh, had a... A place anyway to cut turf. Ah, I like for You know, but you use these turf because they were nice and handy. Nice and handy. Yeah. Anybody could run yes. across and work at them. You know. Yes, of course. During the daytime. This will give you some idea of how convenient the turf bank was to Barney's family. Over the road, through the pretty gate, across a short field, and back four thousand years. The gate then, Mary. Yep. Surrounded now by green fields, the area above and below the turf bank has been benevolently abandoned by Barney and nowadays sports a growth that somehow, strangely, befits its great age. So that would have been right away up, in other words, before well, that? 12 feet good enough. 12 feet? Yes, on top of that. So, certainly twice my oh, height, sure. isn't it? Oh, goodness, surely to goodness. That's a lot of turf. <laughs> Aye, a lot of turf, surely. <laughs> That's kept us going for a long time, obviously. Aye, generations, I suppose. Generations. So if you were to dig down there now, you'd still find what, surely? Flint and so on, and, and certainly heaven so. knows what. Certainly. Right, right. Certainly. It's intriguing to know what's down uh, there, isn't it? Um, Claire Foley said to me, and I was thinking, you know, one of these times she wasn't far out. The other girl was along and she says, you know, morning. She says, would that be a nice place to come on a Sunday afternoon? Oh, I paper we and sat reading. She says, you'd be in sacred ground. <laughs> you'd be in sacred ground. No yeah. annoyance. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you wouldn't know what you'd be sitting on, really, would you, at all? <laughs> you definitely wouldn't. Well, lots of weed trees have been planting themselves here, you know, oh, ever since. Yeah. But I was going to off and burn it, you know. Aye. But you don't like annoying the wee bird's nest. This is Harry Avery's castle on a hill overlooking the town of Newton Stewart. Or at least overlooking it kind of sideways out of the corner of its eye, as it were, if castles could be said to have eyes, that is. It was built sometime in the middle of the 1300s, 
And although Harry was a king of the O'Neill dynasty, you can see that either he or his architect took a fancy to the way the Normans did things. So he was actually Henry Avery O'Neill. And Avery was a kind of distinguishing nickname, which means unkempt, or but through other. Not exactly a very flattering description, so it's unlikely that you'd have called him that to his face. Unless, of course, royal unkemptness was the height of fashion in the middle of the 14th century. Who knows? Now, there's a nasty, really quite horrible tale associated with Harry Avery, or with a much earlier ancestor of his of the same name. But it's obviously the product of a very twisted imagination. So I think I refrain from repeating it. Actually, you should come here and get one of the natives to tell you the story, because they do it with a wicked chuckle in their voice, which I haven't quite perfected yet. Even though the castle hasn't been occupied for over 600 years, it's interesting to note that up until quite recently, you could have taken your horse out and got him fitted up with a whole new saddle and harness, the whole works, practically outside the front door. That's because Joe McMaster's saddlery business used to be located within trotting distance of the portcullis. The shop actually still exists, but believe it or not, it's been moved, locked, stocked and the actual barrel into the Ulster American Folk Park down the road. And it's here that Gordon Colhoun plies the saddlery trade, just as Joe McMaster did, using the very tools that Joe McMaster used. Joe was a saddler in Newton Stewart. He had worked there for 65 years as a saddler. Yeah, yeah. He had served his time with a man called Campbell. Right. And w shortly before Joe died, mm. Joe gave this stuff to the folk park. He gave him this is bench there, the actual bench that he worked on. Well, you don't have to tell me that that's an awful well, old bench there. It's Look. got all the battle scares. It's got all the battle scares. That's mm. really the character, isn't it? Also, yeah. And most of the tools, there are lots of the old tools there. All, yeah. In fact, all the old tools would be Joe's. They were all has original tools. Naturally enough, I had to replace some of them sure. with wear and tear. Aye, aye. And this horse here also... This is what you call the horse? This is called a sewing horse, yeah. This is what you do, obviously. You sit on the horse, sit yeah. This, right, right. Yeah, and you operate it with your foot there. Well, there's actually a moving so part we, to yeah, this, Yeah, there is. This is what you here. Right. That holds the two jaws together when you're sewing. So, so that's like a clamp on it. It's actually a vice, a clamp, yeah. A clamp, right, or a vice, right, I see. That's peculiar to the salary trade only. Yes, yes. So That was actually used by Joe as well. The sewing horse may be peculiar to the saddlery trade, but there are many tools and practices that also belong in the shoemaker shop. What I find somehow gratifying about both trades is the idea that people can still do all of this by hand. Gordon has spent a long time perfecting his skills and is rightly proud of the finished article. But just because these are handmade doesn't mean you can afford to take as long as you want making them. One size fits all, more or less. More or less, all except well, you get now and again you get a special one. Yeah. You've got to make it maybe an 18 inch colour. I see, because you get big donkeys. For a different size, yeah. obviously, yeah. Right, right. And it takes 40 inches of leather to go around that. 40 inches of leather? Yeah. As it, that strikes me as being a very you know lengthy process. And, yeah. and a very skilled one, obviously. So that's not that's that's not a cheap object we're looking at. It here. wouldn't be cheap, no. It would take me <coughs> one day, one full day, to make a colour. Would you make all that yeah, one day? Yeah, one day, yeah. I was going to say it would take you at least two weeks. <laughs> no, no, a day. On yeah, one yeah. day to do everything there? One day to do everything there, yeah. Well, you must be fast, Gordon. Well, this is it. it it's, uh, it's, it's a hard process. You, know. yeah, yeah. you don't be idle now. Yeah. Where did you learn the process? Were, well, you, were, you, were you apprenticed to a saddle maker or something at some Not stage? really. I lived beside, when I was younger, I lived beside an old saddler. He's right. gone now. Right. He lived in a wee town beside me called Straban. Yes. And he yes. taught me the basic stitching. And then in later years, there was another chap lived uh, down below Straban. And he, was, he had been the last man to actually serve his time as a saddler in the town of Straban. And he taught me the colour making. I see. Right. Now, the colour making was something that saddlers only were taught in their last year of apprenticeship. So that's the most complicated yes, thing. Yes, exactly. Right, right. You did seven years apprenticeship on your last year. They didn't teach you colour making until your last year. Until you Just in case you had left. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. In case you would leave before the apprenticeship was up. Yeah. I see. You took the skill away with Correct. You? Ah, Needless to say, we didn't get around to doing colours on my first and last day of apprenticeship. You don't need to serve an apprenticeship to make these handsome artefacts. A little bit of artistic engineering, a sense of fun and years of observation along the riverbanks of Newton Stewart have enabled John Dunbar to turn a stone and some leftover bits of metal into an elegant heron. Does it depend what the stones are actually made of as well? Material? Yeah, Doesn't that's it? right. It's, some of them are harder than others. That's true. Imagine. Yeah, I got a nice stone down at Glen Arm, limestone. Yes. yes. And uh, it was a nice shape. 
very, very easy to drill. Yeah, but yeah. also very easy to break a bit off it. Of course, right. Because yeah. it's brittle as well. Yeah. yeah. And that's the head there. And this is the, the eye. That's You've just, already done the bendy bit I, on I've, that I've done yeah. the bendy bit. Yeah. Probably finer rod would be better, you know. But I think that's good. Look, you start off with this piece of straight that's metal, right, just, right? just like that. There. You bend it around mm -hmm. like that, that's so right. it still doesn't suggest that it's anything other than just a nice graceful shape. You stick that in there, and that becomes yeah. the eye. That's it. And it becomes the beak. Yeah. And then you put these in the back, and lo and behold, it turns into something. Uh, that's Isn't right. That yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Very, very right. good. The accuracy of John's depiction of a heron, I suspect, owes a lot to his many years of observing the real thing at close quarters, on the banks of the river, in other words, and as often as not, I suspect, in the knowledgeable company of Robbie McKinley. Maybe it's the beautiful spring day, I don't know, but there's a certain ratty mole and badger feel about this riverbank dander. It's an entirely agreeable experience, apart, of course, from the name of the river. There's a slight confusion, isn't there, as to the name of the river, um, you know, before and after Hudson Newton Stewart. It's still, this, this is a strule we're walking beside. Yeah, that's a strule. The original name was the, the Po. The Po? Yes, the Po of Fluvia. Now, whether it was <laughs> a matter of diplomacy yeah. that the, the Po water <laughs> was changed, <laughs> but it's now the strule. Actually, the bridge up at Nestle is still known, known as the Poe Bridge. Is it so? Hmm. Yeah. So that's still the strule. When does it become the morn then? Is it after it, after it leaves Newton Stewart, is it? The Ordnance Survey would say that it's down at the meeting of the Derg Water. Yes. We in Newton Stewart say no. It's the confluence of the Owen Kalu Glenelly ah. and the strule. That is the... the uh, that's where the morn That's where the morn starts. We would argue that. Right. But it's still the strule when it's going through the town. Is that what no, you're well, no, no, we say no. Oh, it's not the strule when it's going through the town. No, below Mile Bridge, that's where the morn comes in. Yes. And we would argue that. But the Ordnance Survey, they would show it as the strule going down to where the meeting of the derrick. Until the derrick comes into it. But then. Yeah. Well, is there, is there actually unanimity amongst all you locals who live in Newton Stewart about this, John? Do you? Not the slightest. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Continual argument. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. When Sorry, did I, did I raise a controversial note there? And, oh, not very no, much no, so. No, right. well, <laughs> You're still the best of friends. No, then yeah, we yeah. were naming the, the leisure centre recently, yeah. uh, in the year 2000. The um, committee yeah. <laughs> couldn't agree <laughs> as to whether it was the morn or the stool they were looking at. But you have to we what ended up with a, yeah. a completely different name. We call it the Centre 2000 <laughs> instead of the morn. <laughs> so you can't even agree in the name of the river. No. Well, well, well like, uh, actually, in the uh, beginning of the 1900, the creamery was set up in Newton Stewart. It was known as the Morn. Aye. The Morn Creamery. The Morn Creamery. And the butter was known as the Morn Valley Butter. Yes, yes. Well, anyway, what's in a name after all? Because it's the same water, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just the same water. way down through Strabane yeah. until it goes under the foil. That's right, and the fish don't seem to mind what it's called. Fish don't know what it's called in the today, I'm sure. Yeah. This is a beautiful stretch of riverbank, I must say, along here, you know. Oh, you never know. I never think know. we'll get a trout further up here. You're an optimist, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, then there are going to be a You have to be positive, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.